Welcome to Atacam's Nursing Conferences. This is a series of online education that is offering nursing contact hours. This online program has been approved for one contact hour. Atacam is an approved provider of continuing nursing education by the Pennsylvania State Nursing Association Approvers Unit. Atacam nursing contact hours are acceptable nationwide for licensure renewal. You will be required to complete a survey after watching the YouTube video. You must watch the YouTube video in its entirety and make sure you answer all the survey questions at the end because each of those questions count towards your total score. I wish you the best of luck. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Terrence Shenfield. I started my career on Wall Street and after 15 years decided to change careers and go back to school and I went into the field of respiratory therapy. I quickly became the education coordinator at University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey and I have extensive experience in education. I am also an expert in critical care medicine for the pediatric, neonatal and adult population. I started my own company, a and Lectures, to offer continuous education to respiratory therapists, and then I decided to create another company called Atacam, which would offer continuous education for nurses. I am a provider of nursing education from the Pennsylvania State Nursing Association, and I have spoke both nationally and internationally with my conferences. The title of this course is called, What is the Endocannabinoid System and What is Its Role? The endocannabinoid system is a collection of receptor sites throughout the body which directly influence all physiologic responses. This is the basis of understanding how medical cannabis works. These receptor sites influence very different mechanisms in the body. This lecture will talk all about the endocannabinoid system. This lecture is called, What is the Endocannabinoid System and What is Its Role? My name is Terrence Shenfield, and by the end of this presentation, you're going to have a good grasp on exactly what this system is. In my opinion, understanding how medical cannabis works, you need to have a good understanding of the ratios between THC and CBD. Many times, they name these products Blue Dream, Purple Cindy, which I think offers a great disservice to the medical community. Because what's really important is to understand the ratio. And if you understand the ratio, you'll have a good understanding of what kind of tr diseases you could treat and certain symptoms that could be relieved by medical cannabis. In today's presentation, the objectives are the history of cannabis in the USA, then I will speak about the endocannabinoid system. And importantly, we will speak about the endocannabinoid deficiency. And then we'll follow up with the CB1 and CB2 receptors, which are the main receptor sites of the endocannabinoid system. You cannot speak about medical cannabis without mentioning the name Dr. Raphael Machulam. Dr. Raphael Machulam is an Israeli scientist who's been studying cannabis since the 1960s. He is commonly known as the godfather of medical cannabis. During the 1960s, he actually identified and isolated THC for the first time. He did this for CBD as well. He also received the Nobel Prize for medical cannabis research and is one of the most renowned scientists in the world. Part of his research was that he identified the endocannabinoid system where the CB1 and CB2 receptors are located. The endocannabinoid system consists of both CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB1 receptor are mostly part of the central nervous system, particularly in the cortex, basal ganglia, hippocampus, and cerebellum. The majority of the CB1 receptors are present at the axon terminals. The CB2 receptors, on the contrary, are located throughout the immune system and related organs. They are located at the peripheral nervous system and can be found on the spleen, 
tonsils, thymus glands, and they are also in certain parts of the brain, but not as much as the CB1 receptors. The CB2 receptors are mostly found in greater concentrations through the GI system, where they modulate intestinal inflammatory responses. That is why cannabis works so well with Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome. The purpose of the endocannabinoid system is to maintain homeostasis in the human body. The endocannabinoid system is not just exclusive to humans. It is located in all mammals on this planet. The reason medical cannabis works on so many different disorders is because of the molecular shape of the cannabis molecule. The THC molecule and the CBD molecule looks just like our natural endogenous cannabinoids called ananamide and 2-AG. Our bodies produce two hormones or chemicals. One is called ananamide and the other one is called 2-AG. The molecular shape of these molecules are exactly the same as the cannabis molecule. These two hormones attach to the receptor sites throughout our body, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors and elicit their response. Sometimes our bodies don't produce enough of these natural hormones and as a result of that we have what is known as the endocannabinoid deficiency. But medical cannabis has come to the rescue as they have the same exact molecular shape and they fit very well into these receptor sites and they elicit certain responses. At the same time, our bodies produce enzymes that degrade ananamide and 2-AG, and sometimes this could cause problems. So the point of the endocannabinoid system is this. Our bodies produce these two hormones, ananamide and 2-AG, and cannabis has the same molecular shape as these two hormones, and that's why it elicits such a response on the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. Endocannabinoid deficiency is a clinical spectrum disorder which has been implicated for a number of illnesses including fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, and irritable bowel syndrome. The reason for this is that our bodies produce two natural endogenous cannabinoids, ananamide and 2-AG. When our bodies don't produce enough of these natural cannabinoids, we have deficiency. Just the way if you have diabetes, you have a deficiency in producing insulin and you need external insulin. That is why cannabis has been shown to work for a lot of chronic disorders, especially when you consider it as an endocannabinoid deficiency. I would like to talk about the background and history of medical cannabis. The cannabis plant has been in use for over 8,000 years. China was the first country to sort of use this product for both fabric and ropes, and they also used it for fishing nets. The medicinal use of cannabis in China was used for both rheumatism, gout, and other disorders, and mostly inflammatory disorders. There is evidence that in India around 2000 BC that cannabis was used both in religious ceremonies and as well as medical conditions. Again, most of the use for cannabis at that time was for inflammatory disorders. The hashish was first introduced in the Arab world where they processed the flower of the cannabis plant and they extracted a very concentrated form of cannabis. Western society started using cannabis for medicinal remedies back in the 1850s. What they would do is they would create some extracts and offer for a variety of medical conditions. Actually, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia used medical cannabis as one of their products. Then in 1937, Congress wanted to make some money on it, and they created what is known as the Marijuana Tax Act. So any kind of product that had medical cannabis in it had to be labeled, and some of the money from the proceeds of the sales went to the U.S. government. The first state in the nation, as in the United States, was California. California was the first one to introduce medical cannabis into law in 1996. And I would say that California is a leader in the research in this country because of their long experience with cannabis. During the 1600s to the 1890s, hemp 
production was encouraged in the United States. The American production of hemp was encouraged by the government in the 17th century in order to produce rope, sails, and clothing. In 1619, the Virginia Assembly passed legislation requiring every farmer to grow hemp. Hemp was allowed to be exchanged as a legal tender in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. In 1906, they passed what is called the Pure Food and Drug Act. This act required labeling of all hemp products. In the 1900s and 1920s, Mexican immigrants introduced recreational use of marijuana. After the Mexican Revolution of 1910, Mexican immigrants flooded the United States and introduced American culture to the recreational use of marijuana. The drug became associated with immigrants and the fear of prejudice about Spanish-speaking newcomers became associated with marijuana. Anti-drug campaigners warned against the encroachment of marijuana menace and terrible crimes were attributed to the marijuana use by Mexico. During the 1930s, the fear of marijuana during the Great Depression, massive unemployment, and increased public resentment and fear of Mexican immigrants escalated public and governmental concern about the problem with marijuana. This actually caused so many problems during the 1930s, and they thought it was linked to violence and deviate behavior. In the 1930s, Harry J. Aslinger was the first commissioner of the FBN and remained in that post since till 1962. He created what is known as the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Around 1932, concerned about the rising use of marijuana and research linking its use to crime and other social problems, created pressure for the federal government to take action. Rather than promoting federal legislation, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics strongly encouraged state governments to accept the responsibility for control of the problem by adopting the Uniform State Narcotic Act. In 1936, Reefer Madness, a film created by the French director Louis Gasnier, this film showed that marijuana smokers were deviates and very bad people. The source of this was to promote that marijuana smoking was evil. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed. This statute effectively criminalized marijuana, restricting possession of the drug to individuals who paid an excise tax for certain medical and industrial uses. This was the first step of the U.S. government to create criminality with cannabis. Mayor LaGuardia of New York City in 1944 created a group of medical experts to look into if cannabis was harmful. And that report showed that marijuana did not induce violence or insanity or sex crimes or lead to addiction or other drug use. But the federal government denounced that report. And finally, in the 1940s, there was a slogan called Hemp for Victory. During World War II, imports of hemp and other materials crucial for producing marine cordage or parachutes and other military necessities became scarce. In response, the U.S. Department of Agriculture launched its Hemp for Victory program, encouraging farmers to plant hemp, and they were giving out seeds and grant to grow these plants. By 1943, American farmers registered in the program harvested 375,000 acres of hemp. From 1951 to 1956, strictest sentencing laws were enacted. There were two laws, the Boggs Act of 1952 and the Narcotics Control Act of 1956, which actually set up mandatory sentences for drug-related offenses, including marijuana. First-time offense with marijuana possession carried a minimum sentence of 2 to 10 years with a fine up to $20,000. During the 1960s, Marijuana use was becoming more popular with the counterculture. Changing political climate were more lenient toward marijuana. The use of the drug became widespread in the white upper middle class. Reports by President Kennedy and Johnson found that marijuana use did not induce violence or lead to heavier drugs. In 1972, President Nixon created what is known as the Schaefer Commission. The Schaefer Commission was a panel of medical experts who were looking into marijuana. They wanted to see if marijuana was harmful. To Nixon's surprise, the panel decided that medical marijuana, or just plain marijuana, was not harmful, did not lead into other drugs, 
and was very favorable for marijuana. What happened then, President Nixon rejected the committee's findings. In 1973, that's when the DEA was created. What they did is they merged the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs with the Office of Drug Abuse and Law Enforcement. These two agencies were merged into one commonly known as the Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA. During the 1976, a lot of parents became involved in the movement against marijuana. Many parents felt that this was harmful to their children, and they really enacted some powerful laws during this time. In 1986, the Anti-Drug and Abuse Act was created. This was signed into law by President Reagan. This was the common law called three strikes and you're out. Possession of marijuana was equated to possession of heroin. A lot of times, many the felons actually ended up being in jail for life for possession of marijuana, which is a nonviolent crime. In 1996, California became the first state in the nation to legalize medical marijuana. As of today, there are approximately 32 other states that recognize medical marijuana. To really understand how medical cannabis works, you really need to understand the receptor sites that are located on the endocannabinoid system. The marijuana plant consists of two main cannabinoids. One is called CBD and the other one is THC. You probably heard of THC first, but in reality, CBD was identified first in 1940. In 1964, THC was identified by who else but Raphael Mitchulin. Then in 1988, the CB1 receptor was discovered, and then they cloned that CB1 receptor in 1990. In 1992, the endogenous cannabinoid anandamide was discovered again by Raphael Mitchulin. And then in 1995, they found the second endogenous cannabinoid, 2AG. In 2001, they discovered how exactly cannabis fires between cells and this was called retrograde signaling. I would like to discuss a little bit about the cannabinoid receptor sites that are located on the cell membrane. These receptor sites are commonly called G-protein coupled receptor sites. One of the aspects of this type of receptor sites is that they are lipophilic and only receives fat-soluble compounds. The CB1 receptor site is expressed mainly in the brain and the central nervous system, but is also found on the lungs, liver, and kidneys. The CB2 receptor site is expressed mainly in the immune system, such as the macrophages and lymphocytes. I am not going to get much into the depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition. What I'm going to tell you is that the CB1 receptor is located on the presynaptic neuron and the anandamide and 2AG is released from the postsynaptic neuron. So how it works is when a cell becomes excited, it exhibits this excitement by releasing certain neurotransmitters, namely GABA and glutamate. And what happens is that the 2AG and the anatomide that is released from the postsynaptic membrane actually reduces and inhibits the release of GABA and glutamate, which acts as a method of reducing the excitatory nature of the cell, period. I know this is kind of complex, but you really don't need to know much about that aspect. I wanted to give you a brief overview of the endocannabinoid system. In 1998, Dr. Vincenzo Di Marzo said that the endocannabinoid system consists of relaxing, eating, sleeping, forgetting, and protecting the body. He is a world leader in cannabinoid research, and he said that many of the functions of the endocannabinoid system actually keep our body in perfect homeostasis. The endocannabinoid system consists of two main receptor sites. One is called the CB1, and the other one is called the CB2. The CB1 receptor site is part of our brain and central nervous system, and the CB2 are mostly located on our immune system, such as our white blood cells. The role of the endocannabinoid system is to establish homeostasis. It actually has a key role in hunger, 
fat accumulation, glucose, and lipid metabolism. Much research is being done on the use of endocannabinoid system with diabetes. Our bodies produce two endogenous endocannabinoids. One is called ananamide and the other one is 2-AG. Ananamide and 2-AG fit perfectly into the CB1 and CB2 receptors. When they fit into these receptor sites, some kind of physiologic response is actually done. The enzymes that degrade ananamide and 2-AG are part of our normal flora, and this is what makes us enzymes degrade 2-AG and ananamide, and this is a natural process in our body. The funny thing about medical marijuana is that the molecular shape of the cannabis molecule, namely THC, actually fits perfectly into the CB1 and the CB2 receptor sites. The, and when you think about cannabidiol or CBD, what that does, it makes the natural endogenous cannabinoids of ananamide and 2-AG last longer. It doesn't let it degrade so quickly. That is the main function of CBD. Let us delve further into the cannabinoid receptors CB1 and CB2. The CB1 receptor was discovered in 1990, while the CB2 receptor was discovered in 1993 by a research group from Cambridge University. The cannabinoid THC has been shown to possess very high affinity for the CB1 receptor that is located throughout the brain, the central nervous system, and connective tissue. This is one reason why the consumption of cannabis with high amounts of THC results in relatively a potent effect. It actually relieves pain, nausea, and depression while giving some people a strong euphoric feeling. Another benefit of THC that has been shown to improve patients who are suffering from inflammatory disorders such as arthritis and lupus. The CB2 receptors are located mainly through the immune system and related organs such as the spleen, tonsils, and thymus gland. There is a great concentration of CB2 receptor sites in the GI tract where they modulate intestinal inflammatory response. Many patients who suffer from Crohn's disease or irritable bowel syndrome benefit from cannabis medicine because of the high affinity for the CB2 receptor sites in the GI tract. There is a lot of new research coming out on the CB1 physiologic effects. For example, the CB1 blockade helps with many different types of problems in regard to metabolism. It actually regulates energy intake. The CB1 receptors are widely expressed in the brain, but also are expressed in adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, and the liver, the gut, and the pancreas. Blockade of the CB1 receptor causes a reduction in the food intake and sustained weight loss. Can you imagine? You're going to be using cannabis for weight loss. This system contributes also to the control of lipid and glucose metabolism, and it is well established that the blockade of the CB1 receptor enhances insulin sensitivity in both humans and rodents. In obese states, the endocannabinoid system is increased and might exert unfavorable effects on the insulin-sensitive tissue. There is also research going on on the use of cannabis, especially in THC, in pain relief. Blockade of the CB1 receptors actually induces a norepinephrine release in central spinal and peripheral sites. Actually, the cannabinoid receptor agonist diminishes responsible to pain stimuli. In other words, the CB1 receptor has a lot to do with pain stimulus, and blockade of it actually reduces pain. Because the CB1 receptor sites are mostly located in the brain, because the CB1 receptor is located mostly in the brain, motor control, memory, and learning can all be impacted by this. They have done some studies where people were driving and they tested them before and after the use of cannabis. And after using cannabis, their driving was impaired greatly. Also in regard to memory and learning, many children who use cannabis have delayed motor skills and also delayed memory and thinking skills. And this has been a real problem. 
in regard to immunity and in regard to immunity and inflammatory responses, the CB1 receptor has been known to decrease inflammation in the body. It is also neuroprotective as the cannabis molecule is a great antioxidant and it's been shown to improve the glial cells in the brain. I want to talk about the CB1 receptors in the brain. The CB1 receptors are predominantly in the brain and the peripheral nervous system. And in the brain, these CB1 receptors impact different sections. For example, the hypothalamus, which controls appetite and hormonal levels and also sexual behavior, is predominantly supplied by the CB1 receptor. The basal ganglia, which is involved with motor control and planning, is also well populated by the CB1 receptor. The brain stem and the spinal cord, which are important for vomiting reflex and sensation of pain, is another area predominantly supplied by the CB1 receptors. The hippocampus, which is important for memory and learning, is also part of the CB1 receptors. And the cerebellum, which is motor control and coordination, is populated by the CB1 receptor. The point I'm making is that when THC attaches to the CB1 receptor in these areas, it could impact any of these things. For example, THC actually makes you get the munchies. That's where you get control with your appetite. And secondly, the CB1 receptors and THC impact your motor skills and coordination and your hippocampus, which is part of your memory and learning. That's why THC impacts memory and learning. Something unique about the CB1 receptor is that it's located on the presynaptic neuron rather than the postsynaptic neuron. This is different than any other kind of receptors such as acetylcholine and dopamine receptors where they are in reverse. Actually, the CB1 receptor impacts many other receptors such as the ones listed as acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and many other different neurotransmitters. Let's turn our attention to the CB2 receptor sites. The CB2 receptor sites are mostly located in our immune system. There's not many receptor sites in the brain or the peripheral nervous system, but most of it is located in the spleen, the tonsils, and the thymus. It modulates inflammatory responses. So the role of the CB2 receptor site is to decrease inflammation. The gut is loaded with these CB2 receptor sites, which makes medical marijuana very helpful for such disease conditions such as Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Because of the anti-inflammatory qualities of the CB2 receptor sites, many diseases such as arthritis and Alzheimer's can be treated with this. There is much research being done right now on the CB2 receptor sites in decreasing inflammatory responses. There is a lot of research currently being done on the CB2 receptors, especially in regard to pain modulation. The CB2 receptor inhibits nociception types of pain in the body. It also appears to modulate acute pain and post-surgical pain. In the terms of acute pain, CB2 receptors do not work that well, where morphine probably is much better choice. But in regard to moderate to mild pain, you cannot beat it, especially with chronic inflammatory pain from arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and different types of conditions like that. They also have done some research showing that the CB2 receptor decreases cancer pain, and this has been studied right now in many studies across the country. Let's turn our attention to CBD. CBD has a low affinity for the CB1 and CB2 receptors, which means that CBD does not give you the typical high that's associated with THC. It actually acts as an antagonist for both the CB1 and CB2 receptors. The real benefit of CBD is that it extends the life of anandamide and 2-AG. Anandamide and 2-AG are those natural endogenous cannabinoids that our bodies produce. And it also extends the duration of THC effect. 
All of these point to a great vehicle for homeostasis. There are many different uses for CBD. For example, it's used in epilepsy and Dravet syndrome. It's also used for pain, mild to moderate. It's also used for cancer pain. And there's some new studies showing that it works great for inflammation with arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. CBD is great for sleeping. It's great for anxiety. It's great for mediating the effects of pain. So new research is being done every day on CBD, and you just have to go to Google to see how popular it really is. There is much studies being done today on the endocannabinoid system, specifically the CB1 receptor. They have found that this receptor site has a lot to do with many of the problems we have here in America. For example, insulin resistance. They are doing studies right now showing that the CB1 receptor manipulation can result in improvements in insulin resistance. I'm putting this chart here just to show you some of the future studies that are coming out. I want to thank you for joining me today on my conference, and I hope you learned a lot about the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is being investigated daily by many researchers. Medical marijuana is a Schedule I drug in America, and as a result, not much research has been done. Now they are finding with the legalization of medical marijuana that many of the cannabinoids are being used for various types of disease processes. Research is being funded, and more and more new studies are coming out. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and you come back for more of our online education. I wanted to leave you with some good references on this material. All of these references are current, and if you look them up on Google, you will find some great information on the endocannabinoid system.